So this morning, we'll be looking at the transport system. When you hear the word transport system or transportation generally, what comes into mind, right? So transportation, the regular transportation or the transport system that we know of enable an individual to move from one place to another, right? However, this also apply in biology. So what is transport system in biology or what is transportation in biology? So before I proceed in explaining what transport system entails, we'll just look at the rundown of what we'll be looking at today and by the end of the activities of today, we'll be able to answer all questions pertaining to transportation or transport system. So when we'll be looking at definition of transport system, we'll also be looking at need for transportation. Why exactly do we need transportation in body of living organisms? We're looking at transportation in lower organisms, lower unicellular organisms, to be precise, like your amoeba, like your paramecium, like your chlamydomonas, and so forth and so on. What are the needs for transportation? And what are the materials to be transported, either in plant or in animal? What exactly are the necessary materials that need to be transported in this organism, body of this organisms. Then we we'll look at uh, media for transportation. Media of transportation, we are talking about uh, the processes, uh, the, the means by which materials need to be moved from one place to another in these organisms. What are the media for transportation? And they'll be looking at mechanism of transportation also in some simple multicellular Organism, simple multi or multicellular organism. Then we look at transport system in man. In talking about transport system in man, we're looking at the structure and composition of blood. We're looking at the process of um, the process of blood formation, and then we looked at the needs or the function of blood. And eventually, here we'll stop at the circulatory system. So, circulatory system is about talking a bit about circulatory system, um, and then we'll round it off there. So. Transport system is also the same thing as circulatory system. We can say transport system or we say circulatory system. So what is transportation in biology? So transportation simply means the movement of metabolic materials in the body of an organism from where they are produced to where they are needed, being the target organs, you know, to where they are either stored or removed from the body of an organism. So it's the movement of metabolic materials. Transportation is the movement of metabolic materials from where they are obtained or produced from to where they are used or utilized to where they are stored or removed from the body of an organism. So, transportation, so to say, is the movement of metabolic materials in the body of an organism, be it plant or an animal. So it involves the movement of these metabolic materials in the body of an animals, be it um, uh, from, from the body of an, where they are utilized. So these materials are produced from this region to where they are utilized. And where they are needed or utilized is referred to as the target organ or the target site. So where they are utilized, yeah, here, yeah, or where they are needed is referred to as the target site. Or the target organ. So materials are produced from a particular part of a body, 
right, during metabolic process, so these metabolic materials are manufactured or produced from a particular part of the body. However, they are needed in a specific part of the body. So where they are produced from, yeah, it's where it is manufactured from, produced from. Where they are needed is where they are utilized. So that place where it is needed, where the material is needed, or where the material is utilized, is known as the target organ. That same material can also be stored if it is in excess in the body, or if it is not um, utilized, if all are not utilized. So they uh, will be stored in the body. And if they carry out, eventually, they carry out the metabolic process, right, they will also need to leave the body. So the entire process, right, of movement of metabolic materials from where they are obtained or manufactured or produced from to where they are utilized or used to where they are stored and eventually leave the body of an organism is what we refer to or we call as transport system. Now, having, on, uh, de uh, having defined what transport system is, what is the need or why do we need transportation in the body of an organism? One, one of the reasons why we need transport system in the body of an organism is because materials, every cell requires metabolic mat must obtain must obtain materials for metabolic functions. That is, every living organism cells, right, needs to obtain metabolic materials for them to function effectively, like oxygen, like water, and nutrients. So they need to obtain nutrients. Nutrients need to be obtained for metabolic, uh, for this organism to carry out metabolic functions. So for an organism to carry out metabolic functions, nutrients need to be obtained, like your oxygen, like your nutrients, like your, you know, minerals, and so forth and so on. The, the, the transportation enables that to occur, enables that to take place. That is number one. Two, the end product of metabolic process would eventually need to leave the body of an organism, right? So the removal of this metabolic waste from the body of an organism is enabled by transport system. So we'll put it, we'll write them one after the other. The need for transportation. So what's the need? Number one need is cells obtain materials for metabolic activity. Nutrient, water, so these are materials that are needed by an organism to carry out metabolic functions like your nutrients, water, and oxygen. Two, that's number one. Two, metabolic waste So these are the need for transportation in an organism, be it in plant or be it in animal. Number one is cells obtain materials for metabolic activities, e.g. the new, like your uh, nutrient, like the minerals, dissolved minerals, mineral salt, and whatnot. Also, water is essential for metabolic process or the metabolic activity, and oxygen is also very needed for metabolic activities. So these are the materials that cells must obtain to carry out metabolic activity. And this is made possible through transport system or through transportation. Without transportation, materials that are needed for cells to function effectively, for an organism to function effectively, will not be transported effectively. Uh, effectively. So the second one is metabolic waste. Waste products that are not needed in the body of an organism, be it plant or animal, might ha would, uh, uh, would definitely have to leave the body of that an organism. And this is made possible through transport system. What are the waste materials here? Like your urea, example, urea. And we have 
carbon four oxide. So these are waste materials that are not needed in the body of an organism, and they would have to leave the body of that organisms. And this is made possible by a transport system. Also, minerals, most especially dissolved dissolved minerals, right, are moved from the soil, right, to the, um, the upper part of a plant. The, this is done by, this is made possible through transportation. So water is found at the root soil. This water contains dissolved minerals or dissolved uh, materials, right? So these materials would also need to be transported from the root soil to the upper part of the plant, to the stems, and of course to you know, the shoot system, from the root system to the shoot system. So transportation enables the, transport uh, the movement of dissolved minerals from the shoot system to the, from the root system to the shoot system, to the leaf of a plant, to the stems of a plant, of course, you know, uh, the, the water and other minerals are needed for plants to survive effectively. Also, the food that are manufactured, this is not even written here, but the food that are manufactured at the leaf of a plant also need to be, so they also need to move around the body of that an organism. And this is made possible through transport system. Then hormones, either plant hormones or animal hormones, right, are produced in different parts of the body, right? Plant hormones like auxins, like ibrelin, like cytokinin, like abscisic acid and whatnot, all those hormones need to be transported from where they are manufactured from to where they are needed, right? Where they are manufactured from the site of production, where they are needed is the target site or the target organs. So as such, they will be transported there. And this is also made possible through transport system or through transportation. So hormones, minerals are transported through the body. Then transportation enables the storage of glucose. Right? So when we have a, when animals have excess glucose in their body, this glucose is stored as glycogen in the liver. So this is made possible through transport system. Also, starch is also stored in, uh, in plants also. So this is made possible through transport system. When there's an excess glucose, when there's excess sugar in the body of an organism, it is converted you know, into glycogen and is stored in the liver. So these and many more are the reasons why transport system is needed. So in summary, transport system, transportation in body of an organism is needed to circulate materials, right, for metabolic activity and for, you know, physical activity in the body of an organism. Uh, if physical activity, if you're talking about animal body, we're talking about plant and animal, we're talking about the, uh, it enables metabolic activities to take these materials to move around the body of an organism from where the material is manufactured or produced from to where they are needed to where they are stored if they are not being utilized at that point in time eventually they will be utilized to where they will eventually leave the body of that an organism so that those are the needs for transportation in an organism so next thing we we'll look at for is transportation in lower organisms so we we'll look at lower organisms and in talking about lower organisms emphasis on amoeba and paramecium. So, for simple unicellular organisms like the amoeba and paramecium, this organism have what is called a large surface area, surface area to volume ratio. So SA and VR, surface area to volume ratio. Now, as an organism develops and becomes complex in nature, right? Such an organism will have a decreasing surface area to volume ratio. And as such, the organism will have to develop specialized organ to carry out metabolic activity or metabolic functions in their body. But for simple unicellular organisms like amoeba and paramecium, the fact that they are small, and minute, and they can, they are found in their immediate environment. 
So it becomes easier for materials that are needed for them to function effectively to flow directly into their body, right? These amoeba or paramecium,s Euglena, Chlamydomonas are all found in their in a water environment. That means in their, in their immediate environment. They are very small, right? So because they are small, there's an increase in their surface area to volume ratio. That simply means that materials that are needed for them to carry out metabolic activities can flow directly into their body. Can flow directly into their body through the process called diffusion. So these materials flow directly into their body through the process called diffusion. So they obtain materials from their immediate environment. I think I've explained this before. They obtain materials in their immediate environment because of the high surface area to volume ratio. Remember, the, this usually comes out in JAMB or in Y quest. So they would ask you if a simple unicellular organism have a high surface area to volume ratio or a large surface area to volume ratio. Remember, have this at the back of your mind, that simple unicellular organisms have a large surface area to volume ratio. And this is because they don't have, they don't have a specialized organs now that will enable them to obtain their material. They obtain their material directly from their immediate environment. Materials move or flow through their body. Remember that their, their body, they, they are found in the water environment. So their body is always bath in water, right? So as such, the water enters in their body, and the process through which water is entering into their body, materials are also flowing into their cytoplasm to their vacuole, hole, right? So as such, there's a direct contact with their immediate environment, and materials flows just directly into that environment. This is as a result of high, so large surface area to volume ratio. However, as organism develops, as organisms develops and becomes bigger, like humans, like vertebrates, so to say, or like mostly all multicellular uh, 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 organisms, all complex multicellular organisms, as they become complex, materials can no longer diffuse into their body, right? For them to carry out metabolic activity, they need a specialized organ that will enable them to do that. For me to eat, I need my mouth. For food to break down in my body completely, I need my, there need to be teeth or the tooth to break it down, right? And there need to be other enzymes that work with the food to make it completely broken down, right? This is as a result of the fact that I am a complex organism and I have to develop specialized structure or organs that will enable me to carry out those. For me to take in oxygen, oxygen will not diffuse into my body like it's that of simple unicellular organisms. I will have to make use of my lungs, right? Lungs is an organ that has been developed, designed for that. So as an organism becomes complex, an organism develops an organ that will enable them to carry out metabolic activity. That simply means in a complex multicellular organism, there's a decrease in surface area to volume ratio. I hope that is clear in terms of surface area to volume ratio. So we have looked at the transportation in lower organisms. Now let's look at the materials to be transported. What are the materials to be transported? In, in talking about materials to be transported, we we'll look at both plants, both animals, and plants. So for animals, the number one material to be transported is manufactured food, uh, is digested food. For plants, we have manufactured food. We have water, we have water also. We have oxygen, we also have oxygen. We have hormones, we also have hormones. We don't have enzymes. 
we have antibody we have minerals we also have minerals yeah So, this is just a few of the materials that are transported in an organism, be it plant or in animal. So, for animals, of course, animals can only, digest, can only transport digested food. So, digested food comes into place as a result of digestion or breaking down of complex food materials in the body of an organism. So, once food is broken down completely, the food will need to be transported around the body of an organism. So, that material is uh, digested food is what is distributed in animal. For plant, it is manufactured food because they are, heter they are autotrophic in nature. Plants are generally autotrophic in nature. That simply means they manufacture food. That means they manufacture food or they produce food by themselves through the, the leaves and the phloem. So these materials are transported and are, are, are manufactured in the leaf and they need to be transported around the body of a plant. So transport of manufactured food takes place in uh, plants. Then we have um, water. Water is transported and then we have water. Oxygen. So, we have water. Water is transported in animals. Water is also transported in plants. Oxygen is transported in both plants and animals. Hormones is transported in both plants and animals. We have plant hormones and we have animal hormones. I've mentioned examples of plant hormones where I mentioned plant hormones like auxin, like uh, kinin, cytokinin. And then for animal hormones, of course, we have um, various different type of animal hormones. We have the adrenaline hormones and so forth, the, uh, uh, the gonads hormones and so forth and so on. So these are various types of, of, of hormones that we have in both plants and we have in both animals. Then we have enzymes. We have antibodies. We have mineral salts. I'll uh, have mineral salts also in plants. Then we have fat and oil distributed. And of course, we have carbon dioxide that are also transported out of the body of an organism. I know a person will go, okay, why is uh, carbon dioxide also part of the materials that need to be transported. Of course, carbon. When, we, when we're talking about transport system or transporter, we said materials that are also not needed in the body of an organism will eventually leave the body of that an organism. So when carbon, carbon dioxide is not needed in uh, animals, they eventually leave the body of that an animal. That is also transported to plants. That we, 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 our plant uses them to manufacture their own food. So I hope that is understood and that is clear. These are the materials. There are, other, other, there are many more materials that also can be transported, like the lattice also is a waste product in plants that need to be lattice, the resins and materials that also you know, need to be tra that are transported in plants uh, that will eventually have to leave the body of plants. So we've looked at the materials to be transported in plants. The next thing we look at for is media of transportation Media of transportation. So, when we're in talking about media of transportation, we have about four media of transportation. So, when we're talking about media of transportation, we're simply talking about the means by which materials leave the body of uh, an organism. Number one, we look at cytoplasm. Two, we look at cell sap or latex. Three, we look at blood. And four, we look at the lymph. So these are the four major media of transportation in an organism. So media of transportation in an organism. So number one is cytoplasm. So cytoplasm is a media of transportation in simple unicellular organisms. 
So for simple unicellular organisms, like I said earlier, that due to the large surface area to the volume ratio, materials flow directly into their body through their cytoplasms to the vacuole. hole. So the vacuole hole is, is like a, it's a bag, it's a storage bag, right? Where materials, food materials and water are stored, right? However, cytoplasm serves as an intermediary, as the flow of materials from the outside environment into the body of amoeba, right? For example, example of yeah, organisms that are simple in cellular organisms like amoeba. So it flows into their body. And once they exhaust the materials in their body that are found in the materials that are in the vacuum hole, right? Once it's been exhausted, the, the vacuum hole opens up. The materials also flows out through the cytoplasm to the external environment in that organism. This? Of it. So, cytoplasm is in uh, a simple unicellular organism, like I've explained earlier, and I said that they serve as a media of transportation in an organism. So, for simple unicellular organisms like amoeba, right, they, they are in direct contact with their immediate environment. So, cytoplasm serve as a, a means by which materials moved in from the environment through the cytoplasm to what is called the vacuum hole. So the vacuum hole is a storage bag. It's like a bag in the body of these simple unicellular organisms where materials, you know, stores or materials, you know, comes in, water, fluid, so to say, comes in, and this fluid contains materials that are needed by these organisms to carry out metabolic activity. So once the essential materials that are needed by these uh, organisms are utilized, the waste product also leaves the vacuum hole contract or shrinks. So the moment it shrinks, the materials leave through the cytoplasms to outside the environment of that organism. So, this is how the cytoplasm serves as a media for transportation. This next one is the cell sap or the lattice. So the cell sap or lattice is found in plants. The cell sap is a solution that is highly concentrated. So it's a concentrated solution that is found in the plant. So because of the high level of its concentration, right? So it saps material. Let me use that word. It now saps material, or let's say it absorbs material from the root soil of a plant, from the roots of a plant, and distribute it to the shoot system or to the leaves and the, you know, the upper part, the fluent part of a plant or the stems of a plant. So it literally takes material from the roots, root soil, then take it to the leaf and the stem. So if materials, if dissolved materials, mineral salts and essential nutrients are not distributed from the roots, soil, to the leaf of a plant or the stem of a plant, then this would lead to the death of such a plant. So there need to be proper distribution of materials. Water, essential minerals are distributed from the roots to the leaves and the stem. The food that are produced or that are manufactured through the leaf of a plant and the stems are distributed around the plant even to the root part of a plant. That's what makes plants balance. So material moves from the root soil and moves to the shoot. All these are part of the shoot system. The upper part of a plant is called the shoot system. And the lower part of a plant is called the root system. So movement of materials from the shoot system to the root system is enabled by the what? By the cell sap because it contains a concentrated solution. And this concentrated solution in the vacuum hole of a cell sap enables the movement of these materials no, no, uh, uh, from the root system to the shoot system. So that's how the cell sap or the latex serves as a media of transportation in an organism like plants. So the third one is the blood. The blood. So they ask also in jump question if a blood is a cell or if a blood is a, a tissue. So the blood is a tissue because it contains three different types of cells. So the blood is a liquid tissue that plays important roles in transporting materials in the body of an organism, especially the vertebrates. 
So it transports materials from one part of the body through by circulating around the body of an organism. Most especially dissolved food, digested food, are made possible through blood. Through, through blood, through the movement of blood, the circulation of blood around the body of that and organism. So blood is a media of transportation. The limbs, the lymph is found in the lymphatic system. So there are fluid also in nature that are produced that serves as a transportation of materials in vertebrates found at the lymphatic system, at the subclavian layer of the body, at the, or the jugular layer of the body, where they transport fluid or materials or they produce materials that, you know, fight infections, produce antibodies, you know, that fight infections and diseases in the body of an organism. And the materials uh, that fight diseases and infection in the body of an organism, once they, they are done fighting infections, they collect it, and it also leaves the body of that an organism. So that is just it for the media of transportation in unicellular organisms. So, like I uh, so far so good, we've talked about the four media of transportation in simple unicellular organisms, the cytoplasm in an organism, in simple unicellular organisms, right? And a good example is your amoeba, and then the cell sap in plants, the blood in vertebrates, and of course, also in vertebrates, we have the lymphatic system also that serves as a media of transportation. So we look at mechanism of transportation in some simple multicellular organisms. And when we're talking about simple multicellular organisms, we're talking about like your, um, your hydra, or we look at the tapeworm, so to say. So let's look at the hydra and the tapeworm. So for hydra and tapeworm, they are simple multicellular organisms. So for hydra, hydra is a layer, a two-layered organism, right? It's a two-layered organism. So being a two-layered organism, right, it absorbs material, fluid flows in, into the guts of a hydra. And that is how material is transported. So fluid, they use their, the layer of their body to absorb fluid into their guts. Right? So once food enters into their guts, once fluid, being water or minerals, enter into their guts, this fluid also contains essential nutrients. So inside their guts is where the breaking down of those materials that are you know, absorbed into their body is done. And then once it's completely broken down, right, the materials that are not needed will also eventually leave their body through the, the same way in which it comes in. Remember that in Hydra, like we discussed earlier, when we talk about digestive system, we, it's the, the Hydra only has one way or a simple um, alimentary tract. It doesn't have a double alimentary tract. It only has a simple alimentary tract. I mean, it's just the same way through which food comes in into the body of Hydra is the same way through which digested food materials leaves the body of Hydra. So that is it for, uh, for Hydra. For Hydra, Hydra is a simple multicellular organism. It's simple. It's not a simple, it's, it's not a complex organism. It's simple, it's a small multicellular organism. However, they have an organ, uh, they have uh, a part of their body, you know, the layered part of their body, through which materials flows in into their gut, into the inner part of their body, right? So once the materials flows in into the inner part of their body, um, So the materials flows into their body. Digestion takes place here. Because this is, their, this is like a gut to them. So my, my, uh, digestion takes place inside here. Once the materials that are needed get absorbed into their body, the undigested food materials or the materials that are not needed will eventually leave the body of an organism. For tapeworm, Tapeworm have they ha it has um, a, 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 what is called uh, a body layer that is soft, right? So it is easier 
for materials to get absorbed into their body. It is easier for materials to get absorbed into their body. Uh, cockroaches, uh, 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 insects also, also undergoes uh, this type of transportation in which it's also easier for material, for them to uh, take in materials into their body cavity called, through the, what a part called the hemocils, right? So it comes into their body and it eventually also leaves the body of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, um, Insect. So that is literally how transportation is done in these simple multicellular organisms. And then we we'll look at the next one, which is transport in man. We look at transport in man because man is a complex multicellular organism. So let's look at transport in man. So when we're talking about transportation in man, we will be looking at the structure and composition of blood, right? Because blood is a media of transportation in man. Blood serves as a media of transportation in man. So blood is a fluid that enables, the, it's, it's a tissue, a fluid form that enables the transportation of materials around the body of man. Um, there are three types of blood. One, we have the red blood cell. So the red blood cell is also referred to, also called the erythrocyte. Two, we have the white blood cell. also called the leukocytes. Three, we have the platelets. Also called the thrombocytes. So these are the composition of blood. We have the red blood cell known as the erythrocyte, we have the white blood cells, known as the leukocytes, and then we have the platelets, also known as what? The thrombocytes. Now, let's look at the composition of the red blood cell, or the characteristics of the red blood cell. So for red blood cell, we'll take them one after the other, and we we'll explain them and write, talk about their composition. Number one, red blood cell is manufactured in the bone marrow. So it's produced in the bone marrow. That is number one uh, characteristic. Another characteristic of red blood cell is that it is small, by concave or disc shape. It is small, it is by concave, and it is or disc shape. Other characteristics is its lack nucleus or non nucleated. So it lacks nucleus, or it is non-nucleated. Now that brings us to the fourth one. Because it lacks nucleus, or it's no, it's, uh, it is non-nucleated, then it's short-lived. That means it's short-lived. It, it doesn't last long in the body of an organism. Then the next one is it lasts for... 120 days. So 120 days is approximately three to four months, right? So you can say four months 
However, in your exam, if you see three months, please pick three months. Depends on the examiner. However, it is 120 days that it lived. Then the red blood cell is destroyed by the liver. And then the red nature of red blood cell is as a result of the presence of hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin makes it red. So we can see the quality or the characteristics of red blood cell. Simple. It is produced in the bone marrow. That is where blood is produced from. For the shape, it is small, very small in nature. It is biconcave or a disc shape in nature. It is non-nucleated. It lacks nucleus. Red blood cell does not have a nucleus. So as such, it doesn't live long because it is non-nucleated. At the same time, because it is non-nucleated, it, lack, uh, it lacks nucleus, it is short-lived, right? Short-lived simply means it doesn't live long in the body of an organism. The next one is it lasts for 120 days. And that 120 days could be termed four months or three months. That is destroyed by the liver. The liver destroys the red blood cells. Once the liver destroys the, <clears throat> the red blood cell, right? Then a part of the red blood cell that is destroyed will now be used, that is unconjugated, becomes conjugated. This is like a complex part of biology. So you just like to just dance around it. It's not. So it becomes conjugated and it's used to form bile. That same bile is what is used to emulsify fat in your body in digestion. So can we see? The heme, you no, know, it's divided into hemoglobin. The heme here is the part that is used to form bile, becomes conjugated and form, combines with other materials in the liver and forms bile. So the bile is what is now used, right, to emulsify fat during digestion or digestive system. So, the red nature of it is as a result of what? Of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. So, that is the characteristics of red blood cell. So red blood cell can also be called, do not forget the erythrocytes. Because in your exams, like your jump questions or your Y questions, they may ask you, what is another name for white, uh, red blood cell? What's another name for red blood cell? What's another name for uh, the platelets? Also, they can also link this because in the last year Y question, they link cell to, red, to the blood cell, right? They said, uh, the, the question comes in form of which part of a cell, right, is which part of the cell organelle is not present in blood? Which part of the cell organelle is not present in the blood, the blood cell? Now, the part of a cell organelle is what? It's a nucleus, right? So which of the uh, 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 blood cell lacks nucleus? Of course, the red blood cell. So if you don't think, it's, 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 it's an application. If you don't think, you may not get it. So, so a lot of students were struggling with it. Oh, which part, which part? Of course, the part of a cell organelle that is not in red blood cell is the nucleus. So I, I hope that is clear. So the next thing we look at for, or uh, we explain, is the white blood cell. The white blood cell. So the white blood cell is the opposite of the red blood cell. The white blood cell is the direct opposite of the red blood cell. The white blood cell is, one, is big, is irregular, and amoeboid in shape. Also produced in the marrow. And um, it's 
lived longer and so for white blood cell white blood cell is big it's irregular and it's a moeboid in nature or a moeboid in shape for white blood cell it is also produced in the uh, in the bone marrow and it lived longer and the primary function of white blood cell is to fight infection when the primary function of red blood cell is to transport oxygen and digested food materials. It can also help in blood clotting, or also partake in blood clotting. However, the primary function of red blood cell is to transport oxygen. Oxygen is also transport food. Also take part, 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 take part in blood clotting. So, for white blood cell, white blood cell is big and it's regular in shape and it's amoeboid. Now, amoeba, or when we say something is amoeboid in nature, we are simply saying that such material is, doesn't have shape, it's shapeless. So because it is shapeless and it's bigger than red blood cell, it is everywhere and it lasts longer. So it can penetrate through every part of the body of an organism and detect infections and fight infection. So, white blood cell can be divided into two. One, we can have the phagocytes. And we can also have the lymphocytes. So, the white blood cell can either be the phagocytes, can divide into phagocytes, and the lymphocytes. Phagocytes is the process by which white blood cell, part of a white blood cell, it's a part of a white blood cell, that fights infection, injects and destroys bacteria and other infection in an organism. So it's a part of, an, of uh, a white blood cell, right, that fights, ingests and destroys um, uh, 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 infection. So it's produced in uh, the, uh, the lymphatic system. The lymphocytes also produced at the lymphatic system produces antibody. So antibody attaches itself to the surface of bacteria, right, and destroying those bacteria. So for the lymphocyte, the lymphocyte produces antibody. So this antibody is what helps us to fight infection, literally, in our body, right? So the lymphocyte produced by the lymphatic system, they are fluid in nature, attaches itself to the surface of a bacteria, Right? and destroys that bacteria. There are different types of um, antibody. Right? So in different types of antibody, we also have uh, the antitoxin. We have lysine. We have precipitin. So these are the different types of antibody that we have in the body, or call it antibody that we have in the body. All these are from the white blood cell. Either, like I explained earlier, the phagocytes or the lymphatic, or the lymphocytes. So the process by which a part of the white blood cell called the phagocytes ingest, digest bacteria, and you know, remove them from the body of an organism is called phagocytosis. So phagocytosis is the process by which a white blood cell destroys bacteria, destroys diseases in the body, and infection, right? Destroy diseases, infection in the body, and remove them from the body of an organism. It's called phagocytosis. It's engulf them. Engulf, ingest, and destroy them. So that's the word. It engulfs. Engulf, ingest and destroys diseases. Why the lymphocyte produces antibody. So what antibody does is it attaches itself to the surface of a bacteria and uh, destroy them. So we have the types of antibody. We have the antitoxin. So the antitoxin is a type of antibodies that destroy uh, uh, poisons in the body of an organisms. 
It destroys poisons in the body of our organisms and remove them. So it's an antibody produced in the body that destroys uh, poison in the body of an organism and will eventually remove those poisons. So the next one is we have lysine. So lysine is capable of destroying, of attaching, of dissolving the coats of a bacteria. So what lysine does is it destroys, it, it, it dissolves the coats of a bacteria not enable them to stick together so that whatever drugs that need to fight them, we need to fight them, attack them, and remove them out of their, uh, the body of uh, uh, organisms that are infected. So it's an antibody that dissolves the coat of a bacteria. Then we have precipitins. Precipitins, like, you know, allowing uh, organisms in the body to form like a precipitate, right? So that's where the word comes in. So it also helps to remove them from the body of uh, Organism. We also have what is called the agglutinin. Agglutinin. So it's a part of anti antibody. Call it agglutinin. So for agglutinin, agglutinin helps to glue. I, I use the word glue. You, you used to you no know, helps to glue bacteria together. You know, join them together so they do, they won't uh, circulate around the body. It gums them together, it brings them together, join them together, merge them together so that they can be removed from the body of an organ. So once they are gummed together, right, so the wall of those the, uh, bacteria can be dissolved by lysine and then they can eventually leave the body of that organism. So I hope that is clear when we are talking about the white blood cell and the role of a white blood cell. Like I said, the primary role of a white blood cell is to remove infections and is to fight diseases in the body of an organism. Fight diseases, ingest them, and of course, remove them from the body of an organism. That is the primary role of the white blood cell. Then the next one we'll look at for um, is the platelet. The platelet is also produced in the bone marrow. The platelet is also irregular in shape. Bone marrow irregular in shape and take part in blood clotting. So the primary function of the platelet is to literally take part in blood clotting. That is what it does. It takes part in blood clotting. What do we mean by blood clotting? Blood clotting is a process by which the blood Excess blood is prevented from leaving the body of an, animal, of an organism. That means once an organism suffers a cut or an injury in their body, the ability of blood not to be lost, right, due to the presence of some proteins and enzymes in the body that comes together to prevent the loss of that blood is known as what? It's known as um, blood clotting. So having explained that, we look at the process of blood clotting and you need to pay attention to the process of blood clotting because this also comes out in examination so what are the process that are involved in blood clotting let's explain that So, when the cell of an organism is damaged, or when you have a cut in your body, right? And there's a blood outlet. So what happens is the body releases an, a protein, or an enzyme, rather. An enzyme is called thrombokinase. or thrombokinase or thromboplastin. 
So this thrombokinase or thromboplastin would convert prothrombin We convert what is called an inactive protein. We call it an inactive protein. So an enzyme called uh, thrombokinase or thromboplastin would be reduced, we produce, and we convert An inactive protein to thrombin. Thrombokinase or thromboblastin converts inactive prothrombin to thrombin. So thrombin will convert fibrinogen to fibrin. And this fibrin will now form a mesh. So Let's explain it. So once your body undergoes a cut, or you have a cut in your body as a living organism, right? Take, for example, maybe in the press of playing around um, or having a fire, uh, have, have an accident, in the case of an accident, I have a cut in my body. Once I have a cut in my body, I'm bleeding or cause. Remember, if my body is unable to fight the bleeding, then there's a problem. And that problem is what we'll explain later. We'll call it... Mm -hmm. So, once the body experiences that cut, a protein or an enzyme in the body called thrombokinase would be released. And that thrombokinase or thromboplastin will convert an inactive enzyme called Prothrombin to thrombin, and this happens in the presence of calcium salt, as Ca. So it occurs in the presence of calcium salt, and then the prothrombin will convert thrombin. Uh, 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 thrombin is converted to thrombin, and thrombin will now convert fibrinogen to what? To fibrin. That fibrin is what will form a mesh. That mesh is not what will cover the body of an organism or prevent a heavy blood loss. Trust me, no matter the amount of hydrogen peroxide that is being used, or no matter the amount of methylated spray that is being used in an organism, if these enzymes don't function effectively to cushion the flow of blood, then there will be a problem. An individual that's unable to carry out all this have a genetic disease called hemophilia. And what is hemophilia? Hemophilia is the inability of blood to clot in an organism. So this is defined, hemophilia, as the inability of blood to clot. So the inability of blood to clot is called hemophilia. And this is a genetic disease that is found in some human being. So once such a human being, they must not, you know, experience heavy blood loss. They must not experience any damage in their blood cells or in their blood tissue. Once they experience a, a, a damage in their tissue, then there will be a problem. This will lead to, you know, heavy uh, loss of blood and may eventually lead to the death of such 
uh, an organism. Now, I'm repeating the process of blood clotting because this always comes out in most jam questions, especially the process. Remember, is thrombokinase is the first thing, first enzyme that's well, the first protein that is released is thrombokinase or pro thrombo or thromboplastin. So, if you don't see thrombokinase, you see thromboplastin. Then after it is prothrombin, prothrombin, thrombokinase, prothrombin. Then we have thrombin. Then we have fibrinogen. Then we have fibrin. So these are the process that are involved in blood clotting. So so far so good. We have discussed the structure and composition of blood. We've talked about the structure and function of blood, we've talked about the process that is involved in blood clotting. So the next thing we look at, we look at the last part and just look at a uh, circulatory system uh, in man. So in talking about circulatory system, like I said, So before we talk about circulatory system, have we, have we talked about um, uh, 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 the process of blood clotting and whatnot? Let's not talk about generally the functions of blood because this also comes out in the exam. They might ask you to list at least five functions of blood. Now, what are the functions of blood? One, blood enables the transportation of metabolic materials or food materials around the body of an organism. Blood also enables the movement or the transportation of oxygen once an oxygen combines with blood, it becomes oxygenated blood. I repeat, once oxygen combines with blood, oxygen plus blood becomes oxygenated and this enables the survival of human being or the survival of an organism oxygenated blood so digested food materials once it's broken this is summary of transportation digested food materials once a food is that is broken down into uh, in the simplest form it becomes a digested food and digested food are found where are found in the guts of an organism, right? So, they mix with the blood. The blood will have to go to the lungs to collect oxygen. Once it collects oxygen, then it transports, it moves around the body. So this is how circulation is literally done. So I hope we understand. So that's one. So it enables the transportation of, um, of um, oxygen. Two is hormones are transported through the what? Through the blood. Hormones like insulin from the isolate of Langerhans produce, hormones like adrenaline from the adrenal gland, once these hormones are released from the ductless gland, they move straight, they are deposited into the bloodstream, right? So the blood is now responsible for carrying these uh, hormones from where they are produced to where they are. So that's the fun another function of blood. So hormones are transported around the body or are transported from the site of production to where they are needed via the blood. Take for example, if you are working or the way you are sitting at home now, somebody tell you, see, look at cockroach beside you, and you know you jumped because you are scared. An adrenal hormone or adrenaline which is a hormone responsible for fear, right, has been released. That hormone was transported to your body via blood. So blood is responsible for transportation of hormones around the body. Blood enables the transportation of minerals, of mineral salts around the body of an organism. The blood is also responsible for removal of carbon four oxide from the body of an organism. Because once the blood utilizes the oxygen, right? During this, we explain that when we talk about the heart in our next class, and we explain in depth about the heart. Once the blood utilizes the oxygen that is needed, that uh, that is in the blood, 
it collects the carbon four oxide. This carbon four oxide will be deposited in the lungs, and the lungs will eventually, you know, move it out while collecting the oxygen that will also be needed again. So blood literally moves from the, uh, uh, the heart to the body, uh, from the body to the lungs to collect the um, blood moves from, uh, beg your pardon, from the heart to the lungs, from the lungs to the body, from the body to the heart. This is how it circulates around the body uh, uh, to ensure that it collects oxygen and it removes carbon dioxide out of the body. Of, of. So these are few functions of the, the oxygen, the carbon four oxide, transportation of digested food materials, removal of waste product from an organism, transportation of hormones, of enzymes, transportation of antibodies, these and many more are the functions of the blood. I hope that is clear. So the next thing we look at for is the circulatory system in man. So this is where we are going to stop. We won't go further than this. So circulatory system, when we talk about circulatory system, what does it mean? Circulatory system simply means the movement of materials, most especially blood, around the body of an organism. In this context, man is involved. So the transportation or the movement of materials all around the body of an organism, involving the heart and involving the vessels like the arteries and the capillaries and the vein. That is circulatory system. So the movement of blood involving the various vessels and the heart. And the vessels in this context are the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries. So it involves the heart. It involves the capillaries, uh, the vessels. Which are the artery, the veins, and the capillary. So these are what is involved in transport system. So in circulatory system, there are about three types of circulatory system. Three types of circulatory system. One types. We have closed. So we have single and three we have So these are the three types of circulatory system that we have. We have the closed and open circulatory system. We have the single and double circulatory system. And we have the pulmonary and systemic circulatory system. So for those circulatory system, we'd explain them one after the other, right? So number one, the closed and open circulatory system. For the closed and open circulatory system. So when we talk about a closed circulatory system, this is a type of circulatory system in which this is the type of circulatory system in which the, the system or the flow of blood from the heart to the vessels. It's, it, it involves the direct flow of blood from the heart to the vessels. That means 
the cells are not bit in blood. It's within a closed system. So a, it's, it's involved the direct flow of blood. For closed circulatory system, it involves the direct flow of blood from the hearts to the vessels, the capillaries, the veins, and the whatnot, back to the heart. So it does, it's excluding the cell. It doesn't, go, it doesn't flow outside to the cell. And a good examples are vertebrates, like human also. We also we understand, uh, uh, we undergo what's called a closed circulatory system because oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood will never meet together. They don't meet together. So we experience that closed circulatory system. There are other organisms also that experience closed circulatory system where the flow of blood is, is just is restricted within the vessels, the heart and the vessels. vessels the direct flow of blood from the heart to the vessel. So there's no baiting of blood with the cell. This, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't involve the cell. That is it for closed circulatory system. And for open circulatory system, there's a flow of blood there's a direct flow of blood to the cell, from the heart to the cell in an organism. So these organisms experience what is called a flow of blood directly to the cells. The, uh, um, uh, the uh, annelids experience these types of open circulatory system where blood flows directly from the heart to the cells and it's not restricted to the vessels. So that is just the difference between a closed circulatory system and open circulatory system, uh, uh, so to say. In the next class, we'll we also talk more on that. And the next one is single and double circulatory system. So for single circulatory system, it is common among organism with two chambered hearts. That is just the, uh, the auricles, one or two auricles and one ventricle. An example of organisms that experience that is like fish. So they have just two chambered hearts, the auricle and ventricle. So it's just a single circulatory system. The blood just flows once uh, from the heart to the lungs and uh, that, from the auricle to the ventricle, ventricle to the auricle. So it's just once a single flow of uh, blood. And for a double circulatory system, it, it shows that there's a double flow of blood. That's a double circulation. It doesn't just flow from the heart to the lungs, from the heart to the lungs. It flows from the heart to the lungs and from the lungs back to the heart. So that's a double circulatory system. From the lungs to the heart and from the heart back to the lungs. So that's a double circulatory system. So from this single circulatory system to um, double circulatory system, we're talking about pulmonary and systemic circulatory system, and that is where the large chunk of the work, you know, is entails, which would uh, break down completely in our next meeting. So for pulmonary, whenever you hear the word pulmonary, pulmonary means lungs. So when we talk about pulmonary circulatory system, it's a circulatory system that is between the lungs and the heart. So it's a flow of blood from the, from, the, from, the, from the heart to the lungs. That's the pulmonary circulatory system. So it flows from the heart to the lungs. That is a pulmonary circulatory system. So it's, it's like a, you know, a flow of blood from lungs to the heart. However, for systemic circulatory system, it involves the flow of blood around the system. That means the flow of blood from the lungs to the heart, from the heart back to the body, and from the body, the entire body back to the heart, and from the heart back to the lungs. So that is what um, a systemic circulatory system entails. So why this is restricted from the heart to the lungs, right? This flows from the lungs to the heart, no, this from the heart to the lungs, that is pulmonary. From the heart to the lungs, that is pulmonary, it's not systemic. Now, from the lungs back to the heart then we now have systemic. So 
so this is like a single flow of blood, a single flow of blood. And this is a double flow of blood. But in systemic, it doesn't just flow from the heart to the, uh, the, the lungs. It also flows around the body where the oxygen that is found in the, um, um, the oxygen that is found in the blood is utilized for metabolic activity. So that is the difference between systemic and pulmonary circulatory system. So, so far, so good. We have talked about uh, circulation or circulatory system in an organism. And today, we cover extensively where we talk about the definition of transportation or transport system, where I explain that transportation or transport system simply deals with a movement of metabolic materials from where, in, uh, uh, from where they are obtained to where they are utilized or saved and eventually removed from the body of an organism. And then I talk about needs for transportation. Why do we need transportation? Of course, cells in the body need materials you know, to function maximally, to carry out metabolic functions. They need nutrients. They need carbon four oxide. They need water. Sorry, they need oxygen and water to carry out metabolic activities. Those are a few reasons why we need transport system. The metabolic materials that are not even needed in the body would eventually have to leave the body, right? So transport system makes that available and makes, uh, and makes that easier for them to, to be carried out. Hormones, enzymes are transported from one place of the, uh, uh, from where they are produced to where they are needed in the body of an organism. These are many more are the need for transportation in the body. Transportation in lower organisms have been explained using amoeba as a good example where we talk about surface area to volume ratio. We said that organisms that are smaller have a large surface area to volume ratio. We talk about media for uh, 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 transportation, where we talk about cell sap and letters, talk about cytoplasm, blood, and lymphatic system, and how these help to carry out transportation. Mechanism of transportation in simple unicellular organisms, where we use hydra as example, we talk about tapeworm also, and we talk about insects also as organisms that undergo transportation and the media through which they undergo uh, transportation. We said uh, amoeba, hydra, it's a two layered organisms, and you know, fluid flows into their gut, transportation takes place in their gut, and the materials that are not needed eventually leaves their body. We talk about transportation in man, where we talk about the structure, the composition, and the function of three different types of blood, right? I, I told you also that blood is a tissue. Tissue because it contains three types of cells, right? Which is the red blood cells, which is also known as the, the erythrocyte, the white blood cell, uh, also known as the leukocyte, and of course, the platelets, also known as the thrombocyte, right? I said the thrombocyte, um, uh, the white blood cell can also be divided into what? The lymphocyte and the phagocyte. The lymphocyte carry out uh, the phagocytes carry as phagocytosis, all right, which is which deals with the engulfing and destroying uh, diseases and infection in the body of an organism. And we talk about the lymphocytes, right, which of course produces antibody. This antibody attaches itself to the surface of a disease of an or, or a bacteria, and they destroy. The, and there are different types of antibodies that are found in the body. Uh, when there is an excess antibody in the body, right? and the antigen becomes very strong. What happens is that we have a, what is called natural immunization. You have a natural immunization. The only thing that can destroy the immunity at that point in time is when an individual is infected with HIV AIDS. So once you are infected with HIV AIDS, what HIV does is it doesn't destroy the body, so to say. It doesn't even cause any diseases, so to say, no. What HIV does is it destroys the antibody. That means those soldiers that can fight diseases once they enter into your body, HIV fights them and destroys those barriers, those gates, those antibodies. So once those antibodies are destroyed in the body of an organism, then they will not be able, there won't be antibodies to fight any bacteria that may enter your body. So these bacteria or these infections are what enters the body and destroys the body, and they are called opportunistic infections. They are called opportunistic infections. They are the things that they are the diseases that enters the body and destroys the body of an organism. So you see, HIV can also be controlled because HIV is a virus, a virulent disease, is a virus. However, once an individual is placed on um, on drugs, it gets better with it, and individuals should not be stigmatized once an individual is infected with HIV. Millions of people are living with it, and they should not be stigmatized. These are what 
with knowledge of biology enable us to teach people once they are infected with it. So, having done that, we talk about the process of blood clotting. Now, I said the process of blood clotting involves the thrombokinase, being an enzyme that is released, or, pro -tr or thromboblastin. Thrombokinase or thromboblastin, right, then would activate thrombin, then thrombin activates fibrinogen, and fibrinogen, you know, uh, activates uh, 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 fibrin, and fibrin forces a, uh, forms a mesh, and that mesh is what closes uh, the, uh, the cuts that may happen to the cell. And I further explain that the, once the, cell, the mesh, uh, once a body of an organism is unable to carry out this uh, 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 clotting, then such an individual is battling with what is known as hemophilia. What is hemophilia? Hemophilia is inability of blood to Clot. Then we talk about circulatory system in man. We talk about open and closed circulatory system, single and double circulatory system, pulmonary and systemic circulatory system. In our next class, we we'll talk extensively on heart, the major functions of heart. Then we we'll talk about transportation in plants as well. So thank you and uh, for having me. If there's any questions you you have, kindly drop it at the comment section would provide an answer to that. Do have a lovely day.